It's a blessing to be with you guys tonight, and uh, we're going to be able to take a look at a story in Scripture that maybe a lot of you guys know, and tonight I just want to be able to kind of take a special look at one person in particular in this story, and uh, we're going to read the story of the father who brought his demon-possessed child to Jesus' disciples, and uh, I want to kind of take a special look tonight at uh, the father in his life, and tonight we're going to be uh, in Mark chapter 9, 14 through 29. And uh, we're going to call this message tonight, It's Okay to Not Be Okay. It's okay to not be okay. And we'll soon realize, uh, as we get reading in this story, why that is. So uh, let's go ahead and read uh, Mark 9. Uh, We're going to start in verse 14, and we'll read this, and then uh, go to the Lord in prayer. The Bible says, And when he, he being Jesus, came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd, not one of the scribes, answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And he answered and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, tonight as we come before you and get this opportunity to be in your word, God, we just want to tell you how thankful we are for you. We want to tell you how thankful we are that you love us. God, I'm so thankful tonight that with the issues in our lives, with the things that we're struggling with, God, that you would say to us as well, bring them to me. And tonight, Jesus, I just want to pray and ask that you would just help comfort your church tonight, that you would refresh us, your people, and that, Lord, you would just empower us with the truth of your word, uh, together with the power of your Holy Spirit, to live out the things that we'll learn, to live a life after you, Lord, that you can use, that is effective, that doesn't give room for the enemy to have his way. But, Lord, tonight, we pray that you would have your way, God, and Tonight, I just also want to ask and pray that you'd give me the grace that I need to just speak and teach your word in a way that's consistent with your character, faithful to what your word says, and and just what you want to say, God. Would you give me that grace that I don't have in my own strength? And Lord, tonight, would you just be with us? Would you bless us? And God, would you be blessed as we come before you and as we seek to learn so we can live our lives in a way that worships you, God? So we love you. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Now, I don't know how many of you guys are on social media, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, you know, whatever, right? But when it comes to social media, here's one thing that is true. If you have a Facebook account and you're like, well, I don't, what's this t- Instagram's thing you're talking about? Just let's go with Facebook, right? Uh, Facebook, when you have uh, a profile on there, you might click on someone that you, you know, know or you want to see or, you know, you, we call it stalking people, right? When you go stalk them on social media is when you go look at their profile a lot and uh, try to figure out what's going on, but you would never tell them, oh, yeah, I was looking at your profile. And... Uh, Come on, admit you guys do that. Raise your hand if you do that. I do that. Okay, sorry. Um, so when you have social media, though, the reason, you know, you, you might make a post on your Facebook wall or if you have, like, any kind of other social media, maybe post a picture on your Instagram or on your Twitter. Uh, when you really post things about your life, you never really see anyone post, like, the bad stuff, right? You might have someone complain or go on a rant on Facebook, but when it comes to, like, pictures and all that, Um, really, if you go and look at someone's pictures, it's all the fun things that they've done, all the cool places they've gone, all the interesting things, and really kind of like deep down, the heart behind it is like, I'm going to post this so people see how awesome my life is, right? I want people to be jealous that they're not where I'm at at right now, or sometimes we look at people's profiles and we see they got to go there, or they're doing this, oh, that's so cool, I wish I got to do that, and really, when it comes to social media, uh, a lot of times, we want to put our best up there for people to see, right? We want to put all the good moments so that people look at our lives and think, oh man, they, their life is cool. They maybe got their life together or they do interesting things or, or whatnot. But what if, I was thinking about this, what if your Facebook 
automatically, without your permission, started posting all the worst moments of your life. All the things you would never post on Facebook. All the things you'd never want anyone else to see. All the worst moments, your failures, your mistakes, the time you lose it, the time you trip and fall into a puddle, the time you totally don't act like a good Christian, right? What if your social media or your Facebook or whatever just posted all those moments? We would be horrified, right? If the world truly got to see us for like who we are and not just the person we put up, you know, on our pages to try to look like. And, uh, you know, the truth is, uh, when it comes to social media, it kind of shows uh, the, the way that most of us have this desire to want other people to see that our lives are good. We want other people to see that we're okay, right? We want other people to look at our lives and, and, and see and just be like, oh, they're, they're, they have a great life. And the truth is this, that if we were honest, if our Facebook or whatever posted all of our worst moments, the world would probably see that most of us, as much as we pretend to be okay, oftentimes we're not okay. And tonight I believe the word of God, the story of this father and his son and the disciples and the scribes all points to one thing, and that's when it comes to knowing Jesus, when it comes to coming to Jesus, when it comes to being a Christian, that it is okay to not be okay. It is okay for us as Christians to not be okay. And we're going to look at a few things, uh, a few reasons why we see in this scripture why it's okay to not be okay. So read with me again in verse 14. And uh, the context is Jesus is coming off the mountain with his three disciples, uh, Peter, James, and John, from the Mount of Transfiguration. And as they come down off the mountain, he's coming to the rest of the disciples, and he sees them arguing, having a debate or a dispute or a fight or whatever with the scribes. So it says in verse 14, when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and the scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And he, being G he, Jesus, answered him and said, notice it says answered him, and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Now, the first reason why it's okay to not be okay, write this down or whatever, remember it. The first reason is it's okay to not be okay because no one is really okay. It's okay to not be okay because no one is really okay. If you look at all the people, all the characters in this story, you will see that none of them are really doing well in this moment. None of them are doing okay. But you'll see that many of them, almost all of them, are trying to look like they're doing okay, right? So you have the situation where this father is bringing his boy to the disciples, and the disciples are supposed to cast this demon out of the boy. But as they start doing whatever to try to exercise this demon from the boy, they find that they can't exercise the demon out. They find that they, you know, are praying or whatever they're doing and the demon won't come out. And the scribes most likely saw this as an opportunity to attack Jesus and his ministry through attacking his disciples. And so the disciples are at a place where they start arguing with the scribes. They couldn't really cast out the demon like everyone was expecting, the whole crowd around them watching. And so they start arguing back saying, you know, whatever they were saying, trying to look like they were okay, trying to argue back for their side. The scribes are coming trying to argue for the side of the illegitimacy of Jesus and his disciples' ministry, right? And what we see here is this, that the disciples are unsuccessful, and Jesus will call them, in a sense, faithless. What we also see is that the scribes are bitter and angry, and they're picking fights. They don't like Jesus. They don't like what they're doing, and they see this, and they jump on that opportunity to cause trouble because they're start, they want to pick this fight and bring a, a bad look upon Jesus and his ministry by you know, arguing with their disciples. You see the father and the son, and the father is desperate. And Jesus says to him, and his, his response is to the father, he says, oh, faithless generation, right? So you have a desperate, unbelieving 
father. And of course, this boy is not doing all right because he's demon-possessed. You might even be able to make the argument that the people, even the crowds around them, aren't doing okay because what are they spending their time doing? Trying to come out and see some miracle. But really, their heart may not even be at the place of wanting to see Jesus or be healed or forgiven by Jesus, but they just want to see, in a sense, who's going to win the fight. Scribes versus disciples, it's going down. Who's going to win? So they're out there watching this, right? And you could maybe guess that even their hearts aren't right in this. So if you look at the characters, you have the disciples who aren't okay. They're unsuccessful and faithless. You have the scribes who aren't doing okay because they're bitter and angry and picking fights. Father and son who are desperate and unbelieving, demon-possessed, and even the people who are just wanting to see the fight get entertained and see the drama. In fact, the only person that I see that's doing okay in the story is Jesus, right? He's the only one here that's really doing okay. All right. And so as we look at these people that Jesus is interacting with, none of them are really okay. None of them are where they should be. All of them are exhibiting their issues, right? They're coming out. And Jesus steps in and he says, what are you guys talking about? What are you guys discussing among yourselves? And you see the father step up and give, you know, his side of things. And I think first we need to agree that the church of God, the people of God, that the heart of Jesus for us is for us to be able to look at each other and know that none of us are really doing okay all the time. We might have moments where we feel like everything's great. We might even have seasons that seem to be better than other seasons. But really, at one point or another, none of us are doing okay all the time. We all struggle with different stuff. And this should be, the church should be, an atmosphere where we are able to come in and be real with the fact that we struggle with stuff. Be real with the fact that we're not always okay all the time. Sometimes we come in here broken. Sometimes we come into the house of God with a hard heart because of whatever. Sometimes we come in struggling with sin and feeling condemned. Sometimes we come in prideful or sometimes we come in lazy or greedy or self-centered or, or just whatever, depressed However it might be, we don't always come into this room feeling super spiritual, super excited. Sometimes we come in and we're just here even by faith. Like, God, I, man, I'm struggling, but I'm going to church. And you know what? This should be the place where we're able to come in and be like, no, I'm not really doing all right. There's stuff in my life that's going on that I'm struggling with. Things that are happening that are making me feel depressed or sad or angry or whatever it might be. You know, the scribes spent their time pointing the finger at the disciples who couldn't cast out the demon. The disciples took the bait and started arguing back with the Pharisees instead of trusting God, right? The father is doubting, maybe even mad at the disciples at this point, which we'll see here in just a minute when he says to, the, to Jesus, your disciples couldn't cast out this demon. But the truth is this, that this church, the church, everywhere, and especially here where we are a body, where we're a family, the church, I heard a saying that the church isn't a museum for saints. It's not a place where we're supposed to come and look at how holy everyone is. Ooh, The church isn't a museum for saints, but it's a hospital for sinners. Have you guys ever heard that? And I think that saying is so true. And the truth is this, we could be saved five minutes or five decades, and the truth is this, that we can come in here a sinner needing a hospital. We can come in here a struggling needing a savior. And when it comes to this body, when it comes to us being a part of this church, we want to create an atmosphere for each other where it's okay to not be okay, where it's okay for people to to be real about where they're at, where we're not acting like we have it all together, But the truth is this, we all struggle with many things. James 3 says we all stumble in many things, right? Us, Christians. Not everyone in this story is a Christian. But James says we as Christians all stumble in many things. Have you guys ever read Psalm 73? It's a psalm by a guy named Asaph. And I remember when I first read it, I was pretty blown away by this psalm. Because 
you know, I'd been used to reading David's psalms and, you know, hearing like his struggles and how he trusted God in them. And he would be, you know, angry or struggling or whatever. And uh, then he'd eventually get to the place where he's like, but God is, is awesome. God is delivering me. And, uh, but when I read Psalm 73, there was just a straight, blunt honesty by this guy named Asaph. And you guys can turn there quickly if you want, or I'm just going to read the first few little verses to you in Psalm 73. And Psalm 73 verse 1 says this, Truly God is good to Israel, to such who are pure in heart, but as for me. Do you guys get that? He's saying, hey, God's good to Israel, to those that have a pure heart. God's good to those Christians that have it all together. But as for me, I'm not really like that. I was not in that place. Look what he says. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And what Asaph is saying here is this. Hey, you know, there are people here in Israel who have a pure heart, who are doing right, who are trusting God. But you know what? I don't always feel like I fit in with those people. He's saying, but as for me, I almost went full force off the tracks. I almost lost it. Because of a struggle that I had, that when I saw wicked people prospering, when I saw people that were doing evil and good things were happening to them, but then I look at my life and I was trying to do good and bad things were happening to me, I struggled with that so much, I almost just lost it all. And I love the fact that Asaph is that honest with us in the Bible, in the Word of God. You know, even then, as he was writing this psalm for Israel, for the people to be able to sing these, this song in worship, I love the fact that the Bible gives us the opportunity, gives us the ability, gives us the confidence to be able to say, I mess up sometimes. I don't always do it right. My heart's not always at the place that it needs to be. And he admitted it straight up. As for me, I almost slipped. I almost lost it because of this. He'll go on to talk about how when he went to church and he went into the sanctuary of God, that God showed him the fact that in the end, even though sometimes good things happen to bad people and bad things to good people, that the end for the bad person, the very end, maybe along the way they, there might be blessings, but their end is destruction. But the end for the person that follows God, no matter how bad it is along the way, their end is everlasting life, and that's worth it to follow God. So that's awesome. And he came to that conclusion, and he said, man, what was I thinking? But he wasn't afraid to admit it. He he looked at his life, and he's like, what was I thinking? But he wasn't afraid to say, hey, guys, what was I thinking? You know? Like, he didn't hide it. He showed it. And it was a blessing for people like me who don't always have it all together, who struggle, that I could be like, man, Asaph struggled And I struggle too, but God is good. And so we all have different struggles. Your struggles might be in relationships. It might be in selfishness or greediness or making yourself too busy or lust or anger or laziness or whatever. But the truth is this, we all have issues. And when Jesus looks out at the the crowd and his response to the Father is, oh, faithless generation, how long am I going to have to put up with you? I wonder if his frustration wasn't as much about the fact that the disciples couldn't cast out the demon as much as it was the fact that they didn't have the faith, they didn't have the trust to help each other out. That instead of coming around this father and his son who needed ministry, this, the scribes and the disciples started fighting. I wonder if what frustrated him wasn't as much the inability that they had, but the lack of the heart to just be real and say, we need Jesus. I wonder if that's not what frustrated him. I don't know, but I I wonder. And the truth is this, with our struggles, we're all at the place where we need to hear what Jesus said to that father about his struggle. Because he said, bring the struggle, bring your son, bring the thing that you're struggling with to me. Bring him to me. And the truth is this, we might be able to hide it better than others. We might struggle with things that aren't as obvious as other people, but we all struggle with stuff And we are all at a place where we need to simply say, hey, I struggle. And we all need to help each other bring those struggles to the one who can do something about them. 
We're there to pray for each other, to help, for, to help each other, to be a source of encouragement for each other. And instead of closing the door to those that mess up, who struggle, who blow it, we should open the door to those who mess up. And I'm talking about Christians, right? We should open the door. And some people, you know, I, I've seen Christians, and I'm not saying I never struggle with judging people, but I've seen Christians look at other Christians that are struggling and be like, hey, the Bible says we shouldn't even eat with people who are sinning, but say that they're a Christian. And they avoid them. And the truth is this, that section of scripture is talking about the the issue that was happening specifically in the Corinthian church of sexual immorality and, and people that were going to church looking to use the church as an opportunity to fulfill their sinful desires with no interest of really following the Lord. But we see this, that Christians that want to follow the Lord still struggle, still mess up. And what people like that need at a time like that more than ever is not a shut door, but an open door saying, hey, I'm not saying your sin's okay, but it's okay to not be okay because that's what we need, an open door to be able to deal with the issue that's not making you okay. Does that make sense or is that really confusing? Okay. So Jesus looks to the crowd and he says, how long do I have to put up with you guys? Oh, faithless generation. Let's look at verse 20. And uh, he says, it says this, then they brought him to him. They brought the boy to Jesus. And when they saw him immediately, and when he saw him, when the boy saw Jesus, immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he, Jesus, asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both in fire and into the water to destroy him. But if... You can do anything. Have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. So, second point is this. It's okay to not be okay, so tell Jesus the whole truth. First point was, it's okay to not be okay because no one's really okay. But the second point is this, it's okay to not be okay, so tell Jesus the whole truth. And the thing I want to focus on on these, in these verses right here is the fact that Jesus pulls the whole truth of what's really going on out of the Father. If you look back at verse 17, the description that the father gives of the issue with the demon possession of his son, he says, hey, you know, the, my son has a mute spirit and it seizes him and throws him down and he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and your disciples can't cast it out. And so he says, bring the boy to me. And when the boy sees Jesus, he, he, that demon manifests itself and he starts convulsing. He's on the ground foaming at the mouth. And, and then Jesus doesn't just settle for what the father told him at the beginning. He digs a little deeper and he says, how long has this been happening to your son? He asks him another question. And we see this, that as Jesus asks him this question, that the father starts to open up with details about the issue with the son that he had previously withheld. He hadn't told Jesus all of it, right? And there's one really important thing that he reveals in his answer that I believe Jesus was wanting to kind of reveal, pull apart, and, and really expose this issue that was going on, not just with the son, but with the father. Because he says, how long has this been happening? And he says, since he was a child. And it's not only that the, the demon throws him down on the ground, but he'll try to aim for the fire, or he'll try to aim for water to actually kill, to destroy my son. And then the father says, which, which were details that he left out before, and then he says something so interesting. He says to Jesus, he says, so if you are able to do anything, have compassion on us. He reveals the struggle that he's going through. He at first makes it about the son, about his son, who obviously this father loved dearly. But in doing so, in Jesus asking him this question, the truth about where the Father's heart is starts to show itself. Because the Father doesn't say, Jesus, I know you can heal him. Just say the word and he'll be, and the demon will be cast out. He says, Jesus, if you can even do this, then have compassion on us. Showing us that he was struggling with believing He was struggling with believing in Jesus and Jesus' ability to do something 
for the situation. So this guy was a man who grew up in Israel. He had been hearing the word of God, most likely. He most likely knew of a coming Messiah. The word was getting around that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was healing the sick, that he was, you know, making the blind to see, that he was curing those with leprosy of their disease. You know, he came to Jesus and his disciples because he had heard that they had cast out other demons. And he comes and he says, you know what? I've been struggling with my son in this demon possession since my son was a child child, maybe Jesus and his disciples can do something about my boy. And he's probably going expecting to see Jesus, but he comes to his disciples and Jesus is nowhere to be found. And he says to his disciples, can you heal my son? Can you cast out this demon? And as the disciples try but fail, I wonder if this father's heart was kind of at a place of, I, I thought so. I thought it might go like this. This whole stuff about Jesus, you know, who knows what the truth is. But it's obvious that, that my son still has a demon. And so as this man was wondering or struggling over the issue of whether Jesus could do anything, he comes to a point where the heart of the matter for him is revealed when he says, if you can do anything about this, then Jesus, have compassion on us. And if being honest about where you're at can free you from bondage, if this father could have just come out and, and been honest if, and then Jesus could deal with that situation, the truth is this, that if being fully honest with God can free you fully, telling half the truth to God, being halfway honest can keep you half bound. If being fully honest with the Lord can start to free you from bondage, can free you fully, being halfway honest will keep you half bound bound. So Jesus knew that if this guy didn't talk about the real issue in his life, that Jesus couldn't minister or address the real problem. Do you see what he did? You know, the father comes and, and like I said, made it all about the son, but Jesus knew in your heart, father of this boy, whatever his name is, he said, in your heart, there's an issue that I want to heal as well. And you know what? We can try to hide our struggles from God sometimes, can't we? We can try to pretend like nothing's wrong. Sometimes we even do it the same way that this father did by focusing on, on fixing other people. Oh, and giving advice to other people. Oh, and telling this person what they should do in that situation. Or encouraging that person to follow God. But the truth is this, in our own heart, we need to, ex we need to stop ignoring the things that we're keeping from the Lord, the struggles that we're having. There are many Christians like this who are so okay with, with helping others, but when it comes to their own life, it's like a closed door. And there's, you know, a sense of ignoring the issues that God wants to deal with. But the truth is this, when God wants to use you to heal others, to bring healing to others, to bring encouragement to others, God also is concerned with you as well. You know, if you want to be used by God, I heard it said that God is just as concerned, it's Warren Wiersbe, I remember now, God is just as concerned about the minister as he is about the ministry, meaning this, that he wants to use your life, but he also wants to heal your life, he also wants to minister to you, and 2 Corinthians tells us that that is the, the encouragement the, that we can give to other people. The comfort that we can give the other, to other people, the ministry we can give to other people, the same comfort, ministry, healing that God has given to us. So let me ask you, are you trying to live this Christian life not being real with God about the issues that you're going through, not being real with God about the sins that you're struggling with, ignoring the things in your life that you know need to change because it's easier to just not deal with them day to day than to be honest about God, about where we're at. The truth is this, we need to be honest with him. We need to come before him because he will dig out the truth. This man isn't the only man, the only person that Jesus did this to. Think about the woman at the well, right? She comes to Jesus and she puts on a face like it's all okay. You know, he asks for a drink of water and, and she starts saying, why are you asking me? Jews have no dealings with Samaritans and I'm a woman, you're a man and, and all this stuff. And he, he tells her, hey, if you knew who it was that was asking you for a drink of water, you would ask me for water that satisfies your soul. And when she hears those words, she kind of puts up this face like it's okay. And then Jesus even calls her out. He, he says, all right, well, if you want this water, go get your husband, right? And it's not that Jesus didn't know that she didn't have a husband. He knew that she had had multiple 
husbands, and that the man that she was with now wasn't even her husband. And so he says that, and she's like, uh, I have no husband. He calls her out on it. And even as Jesus is digging deep into the issues of this woman's life, you know what her response is? When he reveals the truth, hey, you've had five husbands, and the one you're with now isn't even your husband. You know what she says? Instead of like, you are the Messiah. You're right. Let's deal with this. God, I can hide nothing from you. She's like, oh, I perceive you are a prophet, right? And she's like, let me ask you a spiritual question about where we should worship and stuff. And Jesus is, you know, it's like so obvious. She tries to block the fact that God is trying to peel the layers away to deal with the real issue in her life that she needs a relationship with him. And she puts up this mask like it's all good. And eventually Jesus keeps peeling and peeling until It gets through to her, and she says, I know that the Messiah is coming, and Jesus says, the person who is speaking with you is the Messiah. I who speak to you am he. And in that moment, he gets through to her. She receives Jesus, and she goes, and now that he's touched her heart, now that he's been able to reach her in the place of her own struggle, she can now go and proclaim to the rest of the people that she knows, come see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And the truth is this, we need to let God minister to us where we're at. We need to stop hiding our struggles because the Bible says this, that the person who tries to cover his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes his sin will have mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. And so Jesus knew that if this guy didn't talk about the inward struggle that he was going through, as well as what he'd already revealed about the outward struggle, that even if Jesus could or did heal this boy of his demon possession, that that father would still go home with an issue of the heart that would just lead to other issues as well. And Jesus wants to peel back those things in our lives. And I want to add one thing, that God has blessed us with lots of great friends in this church, lots of amazing people in this church, lots of amazing pastors and leaders. And this is a place where God is providing people for all of us. None of us are outside of a place of need for this, where we can be honest with one another as well. We need to be honest with God, but the Bible also says in James chapter 6 that we are meant to confess our sins to one another and pray for each other. Let's turn there real quick. James chapter 6, verse 16. Five. Sorry. James chapter 5, 16 says this. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, right? Right? And go on a little further. It says, And Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And when he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And when he prayed again that the the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. And so the context of this, this thing that he describes about Elijah in prayer is in the context of praying for each other when we're confessing our sins to one another. And I'm not saying it's a good idea necessarily to go and just tell everyone all of your stuff, right? You know, to go and just tell your sins to every person. But there should be people or at least a person in our lives that can look from the outside in who we can confess our sins to, who we can confess our struggles to. And then that person, the Bible has called us to be in a community of believers where that person can then pray for us because guess what? Prayer works. And you know what? We need other people in our lives praying for us, ministering to us, telling us the truth, helping us to not fall into sin. We all need those things in our lives. There's not one of us who are going to make it apart from the fellowship of other people that God wants us to be. And that's why the Bible says don't forsake getting together with other believers. Don't stop going to church. And you know you can stop going to church without stopping going to church. You can go to church, but you're not a part of the church. You can go to the building called the church, but are you in the church? Are you in the church? Are you with other believers? Are you in fellowship? Because guess what? We're not meant to do this alone. And there's only so long we can go by ourselves without 
our mind starting to believe a lie, without us starting to get bitter, or without us starting to struggle, and when we don't have other people there to help us, we can go farther away from Christ than we ever thought we would. Even the most mature Christian, even the Christian in the highest position of authority or whatever, right? We see it happening all the time. And the truth is this, God is meant for us to be with each other so that we should live in a way where we make people realize it's okay to not be okay. The door's open. You can be real about where you're at here. But then we also need to be at a place where we're willing to walk through that open door. When we come to a place when, in a relationship or people or pastors or leaders or whatever where we know, hey, it's okay to be real with, with them about where I'm at, we also need to know that as long as that's okay, we need to take advantage of that and confess our sins to one another. And, you know, I'm not saying, like, go up to, the, you know, they're like, hey, meet someone new, and you're like, hey, I do this, you know? And they're like, whoa, don't touch me. <laughs> but, it's, you know, we need to be at a place where we're willing and it's weird to ask people, hey, can I confess my sins to you? And not all of us are socially, like, cool with that. But the truth is this, we can pray for it, too. You know, you might be at a place where, like, even right now you're thinking, nope, no way. I'm not telling anybody. No one's going to know. I'm going to leave church today, pretend like this message never happened, and by next week everyone will have forgotten and I'll be scot-free. You are the one. Listen. God has meant for you to be in this. And so to not be in fellowship is to be disobedient. And you know, relationships don't happen overnight. Sometimes it takes just a simple step of getting involved a little more. And I'm not saying tonight you need to, you know, meet someone here and that's going to be your life person for your confession or whatever. But start praying, start serving, and start seeking for someone in your life that you can be real with. You know, and start seeking, asking, praying for someone that you can open the door to be real with you with. If that was said in English right, I don't know. All right, so when it comes to this story, we can be, it's okay to not be okay because no one's okay. It's okay to not be okay, so tell Jesus the whole truth. And then next, it's okay to not be okay because there's no problem too big for Jesus to handle. Let me flip back to Mark real quick, and let's pick it up in verse 25. Actually, we'll go back to verse 22. It says, the father speaking, and often he's thrown him in both fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Then Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now the father's response, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and to enter him no more. And the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to him, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. So it's interesting here that we see that when it comes to the demon possession of this boy, that Jesus and his disciples, when they ask him, Why couldn't we cast out this demon? He tells them that this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And that shows us there are actually different roles ranks, different levels of authority within the demonic realm, and there are some with more power and authority than others, some that can't come out but by prayer and fasting, and that was the reason why the disciples couldn't cast out this demon, but what I want to focus on for just a minute here is the Father's response to Jesus. When he, when Jesus says to the Father, all things are possible to him who believes, the Father cries out with tears in his eyes and finally he breaks and has this moment of true honesty with Jesus and he tells him the whole truth and he says Jesus I believe but I'm struggling with believing so I believe but help the part of me that still has unbelief and I love I love 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 that this father is just totally 
honest with Jesus. I love that Jesus gives him the open door, that he walks through that open door, and that he meets Jesus right there. And so it's okay to not be okay, because if you realize we're not, none of us are okay, you have that open door to just be real. If you tell Jesus the whole truth and you don't hide anything back, what you'll find is this, that there's no problem too big for Jesus. There's nothing you can be going through And listen, there's no sin that you could be struggling with that is outside of Jesus' power to win a victory in your life over. There's nothing. He says, to him who believes all things are possible, and the Father says, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I love that then Jesus heals the boy. You know what that means? That even though this father only had a little bit of faith, He didn't have, you know, full, amazing, powerful faith. He was struggling to have the little bit of faith that he had. And Jesus looked at the faith of that father and he said, that's enough faith. I can work with that. And he takes that doubting faith, that struggling faith of the father. And in that moment of honesty, when he says, I have faith, but help my unbelief as well. Jesus meets him where he's at. And so think about it. Do you think that your issues are are too big for Jesus to handle? Do you think your sins are too bad for Jesus to forgive? You've struggled with sin for so long, or this particular sin for so long, that maybe you've started to believe that you'll never see it won, or a victory over it. And the truth is this, that even though you might feel like the grip that that issue, the grip that that sin has on you is so deep, that there is still, even then, no sin too bad that Jesus can't forgive it, and no struggle too great that Jesus can't bring you through it. So for the boy, you know, there's no heart too far. This boy is obviously not saved. He is demon-possessed. And even for this boy, we see the ministry happen to him where not only the demons cast out, but I love the part that where Jesus takes his hand and raises him up, right? The, wh- however it worked out, the exorcism of this demon was so traumatizing that it left this boy as dead. That may even mean that he was so But Jesus takes him by the hand and raises him up. And so we see that even for this demon-possessed boy, that in this moment, although he might have been farther from God than any of us in this room, that he was close to God too because he was just one miracle from Jesus away from being raised up to new life. And I love that about Jesus. I love that he does it. And if we're anything if we're demon-possessed or less as far as the, the, the severeness of our sin, we see right here, just right here, that Jesus can handle it. But we also know that 1 John chapter 1 says this. I think it's chapter 1. There's at least one chapter in John, right? I can't get that one wrong. 1 John 1, 6-7, I'll just read it to you, says this. If we say we have fellowship with him but we walk in darkness... We're just lying and we don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. How much sin? All sin, right? The blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse a man from all sin. I heard a story from, I was listening to Pastor Chuck Smith a while back in and uh, in this passage in 1 John, and he, tell, he told a story about Charles Finney. And uh, he was a man that was used powerfully by God to bring revival in the 1700s. And, and Charles Finney had had a meeting, uh, had uh, gone to a church and preached the gospel and kind of had like a, a revival kind of meeting or whatever. And uh, there was a man that was waiting for him outside the church after this meeting. And the man walked up to him and said, hey, I need to meet with you later on after the service tonight. And so Charles Finney said, yeah, I'll meet with you. Gave him his word that he would meet with him. And then the deacons of the church came up to Charles after the man left and said, hey, what did that man want? And uh, Charles said, he wants to meet with me after church tonight. And they said, he's the worst man in town. You cannot meet with him. He's got hired killers. He's involved in all kinds of illegal activities. You know, all kinds of things that are terrible. You, actually, you absolutely can't meet with him. It's probably that your message tonight left, you know, are, is going to convict people to not do the things that he's involved with. And he's mad at you for taking away his business. And he's probably got it out for you and stuff. And... Uh, 
Charles said, I'm going to meet with him afterwards either way. And so after the church that night, the deacons were watching, and Charles still met with the man, and the man said, okay, follow me. And he led him around the corner, down an alleyway, unlocked a, a back door to some building, opened it and said, come in, and closed the door behind him, locked it, told Charles, have a seat. And the man went over to his desk, sat down on the desk, opened the drawer, pulled out a revolver and put it on the desk. And he said, I need to ask you something. You said something today, and I need to ask you if what you said is really true. I heard you say that there's no sin too big that God can't forgive. I heard you say that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse a man from all sin. Is that true? And Charles Finney said, yes, the word of God says that the Bible or that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse a man from all sin. And the man said, wait, 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 you don't know me. I have an illegal gambling room on the other side of that wall right there, and all the machines are fixed. I've taken the last dollar from many men to the point where they've been so broke and so hopeless that they've gone out and committed suicide. Are you telling me that God can forgive me of that sin? And Charles Finney, shocked, could do nothing but respond, the word of God says that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse a man from all sin. And then he said, that's not it. Outside over there, I have a bar, and many wives have come to me in rags, begging me not to sell alcohol to their husbands because they come and they spend their last dollar and, and they're alcoholics and, have no, and they have nothing left to provide for their family with. And I just throw those women out. And then once their husbands have spent their last dollar and they have nothing more to spend on alcohol, I'll throw them out too with nothing to the point where some of them have even gone and committed suicide. Are you telling me that God can forgive me of that sin? And Charles not knowing what else to say, looked at him and said, I don't know what else to tell you. The Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse a man from all sin. And he said, that's not all. This gun, I've used it myself with my own hand to kill many men. And I've hired others to go and kill other men that I haven't killed myself. Are you telling me that God can forgive me of even that? And Charles looked at the man and, and he said, the word of God says that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse a man from all sin. And he said, there's one more thing. I have a wife and a little daughter at home. And I've been married for 16 years. And I haven't said a good or decent word to that woman in our whole marriage. I've been abusive. The other day, my daughter came up to give me a hug when I finally got home and wanting nothing to do with her in anger. I pushed her away from me and she fell and burned herself on our stove. Are you telling me that with the worthless kind of man that I've been to my wife and my little daughter that I can be even forgiven of that? And Charles Finney, <laughs> he said that he started shaking the man, saying, you've told me about the worst things that I've ever heard and if it were, from, if it were me, I don't know if I could forgive you. But all I can tell you is that the word of God says that God says that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse a man from all sin. And the story goes that the man went home, put his daughter on his lap for the first time in years, held her, and told her that he loved her. He changed. He, had become, he became a new man for his wife. He closed his bar and gambling room and became known in the community for his generosity and his giving and his involvement in the church. And that because he heard the message that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse a man from all sin, he was changed by God, by the power of Jesus Christ forever. And here's the truth. That the blood of Jesus Christ can forgive a man, a woman, anyone in here of all sin. Amen. And so, for us, it's okay to not be okay because there's no struggle too big. There's no sin too great that Jesus can't forgive it. And all we need is to have a little faith like that father. He didn't come righteous. He didn't come having got his life together first. He came struggling to Jesus, and Jesus not only healed, exercised that demon from his son, but addressed and healed the issue in this man's heart as well. And so my question to you tonight is, are you pretending like you're okay when you're not? God knows. He already knows the condition of our heart. He knows exactly where we're at. 
So let's be real with him. Let's be real with each other. Let's be the kind of Christians that don't make it seem like people have to be holy enough to come around us, but let's have the open door to say, hey, no one's okay, but I'm going to do my best to help you overcome this by the power of Jesus Christ in your life. And let's be honest with other people about what we're dealing with. Let's pray for God to send those kind of people into our lives that we can be honest with, to give us divine appointments and relationships. And let's realize this, that no matter where we're at, no matter what we're doing, no matter what we're going through, we can do exactly what Jesus commanded the Father to do when he said, bring the boy to me. Bring your issue to him. Bring your sin to him. Bring your brokenness to him, your depression to him, your anger to him, your lust to him. Bring him anything and everything because here's the deal. We don't want anything in our lives that would keep us from the relationship and freedom that we have through Jesus because of his sacrifice for us on the cross. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word tonight. We thank you so much for the open door that you give each of us to just come to you, to not have to hide who we are, to not have to hide what we're going through. Father, would you just even sweep through this room and in each of our hearts through your Holy Spirit, bringing us to a place of recognizing where we need to be before you, Lord. Would you bring those things to the surface so that you can deal with them, wipe them away, and let us walk in freedom in you. God, I pray for us as a church, for my life and all of us together, that God, you would help us to be inviting to those that are struggling, that there would seem to be an open door with us for anyone who's struggling, who's messed up, who's sinning to come, and to be able to know that they're not going to receive judgment, but ministry. And God, give us the boldness to be able to tell the truth in those times. And God, I just pray that you would help us to be at a place in our lives, God, where the things that we go through, we're surrendering them to you, we're praying for each other, and we're growing in our walks with you, God, so that our lives might be effective and useful for reaching this lost world. And as we stay in an attitude of prayer tonight, maybe for you, as we've studied the word of God, you would be at a place where you kind of recognize, I'm not okay where I'm at. I I'm not where I need to be in my walk with God. Maybe for you, you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The reason Jesus can forgive us of all of our sin is because he died in our place for all of our sin. The Bible says that he was crucified, and when that happened, God punished him for our wrongs, for our sins. That Jesus was dead and buried three days later, rose again to be our Lord and Savior today. And all we need to do to be forgiven of our sins is simply repent of them, say we don't want them anymore, come to Jesus, confess them, and ask for that forgiveness, making Jesus our Lord. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And tonight, if you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus, I just want to pray for you. And you know that that's you, and tonight you just feel the Spirit moving in your life. And if that's you and you'd say, I want to receive Jesus tonight, would you just raise your hand so we can see who you are as we stay in an attitude of prayer? Anyone here tonight that say, I want to start a relationship with Jesus, just don't be afraid. Raise your hand tonight so that we can see who you are and pray for you anyone at all. And maybe for you tonight, you have given your life to Jesus, but you've been at a place where you know in your walk with Jesus, you're not where you need to be. Tonight, you would maybe desire a fresh start in your relationship with Jesus. And if that's you, I want to pray for you as well. We want to pray for you. Would you just raise your hand as well so we can see who you are and lift you up in prayer? Is there anyone that would say, I want to start afresh and anew with my relationship with him tonight. Okay, see you back here. Anyone else? Heavenly Father, as we've heard from your word tonight, just want to thank you for you moving in our lives, for you edifying and growing us, God, and for this person that's raised their hand, I pray that you just be with them, that you'd encourage them, give them boldness to make a stand for you, Lord. We love you. And God, we just uh, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us tonight to be 
together to be in your word. And for that person that raised their hand tonight, I just want to lead you in a simple prayer. And uh, this is a prayer that you can say quietly in your own heart, and it's not magic words to make you right with God, but something you just got to mean in your own heart and, and believe, and the word of God says you'll be forgiven. And so for that person that raised their hand, you can just follow me quietly in prayer uh, to yourself. You can just say, Lord Jesus, I love you. Thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you that even when I struggle, you still love me. Jesus, I want you to make a change in my life. I repent of the sin that's been keeping me from you. Would you forgive me, Lord Jesus? Would you change me? And would you help me to walk in the freedom that you've given me? I love you, Jesus. And I pray these things in your name. Amen.